we'll have a pause and you can feed back to, to me a bit. I'd like to, to know what you're getting out of all of this. But let me say number four, and I think this is the most important one. If you forget the other three, this is the one I'd like you to remember. And I'm actually going to set you an exercise for next week to follow up on this. Yes, I'll tell you what the test is too. Oh, no. <laughs> well, I'll tell you now. The test is to memorize the whole of the book of Ephesians. <laughs> Failing that, I'll give you an alternative. <laughs> All right, one more thing, and I think, I think this is really the most important one for a number of different reasons. I think it's important for us, any time we read from a New Testament letter, to read the whole of the letter right through. And I want to add, to read it out aloud. Uh, sorry, can you say read the whole letter, like All just the... The whole book, or, or literally, like for 20, just the whole of 20. And no, I mean the whole letter. So, if the it's whole, a, oh, the, whole the whole letter, so if it's the letter to the Galatians, you start at the beginning, chapter 1, verse 1, and you finish no, at 6, it. verse 20, I think it is, or 23, something like that. Mm -hmm. You read the whole of the letter. Now, don't panic, mm -hmm. I'll tell you a little bit about that in a minute or two. Mm -hmm. 24. 24, okay, that wasn't a bad guess, was it? Mm. <laughs> okay, so I mean, read the whole letter. As if, just as if, your mother or your best friend or a schoolmate or your father or your girlfriend or boyfriend wrote you a letter and you wouldn't say, well, I'll read a couple of bits of this and I'll put it away for three weeks and then I'll pull out another little bit and then I'll put it away for another three weeks and after six months you might have read your mother's letter. We wouldn't do that, would we? No. You read the whole thing all the way through. And if it's from a girlfriend or boyfriend, you read it again. <laughs> and you read it again. And you read it again until it's folded and creased and tear stained and everything else. So I want to suggest, no, I want to recommend, I want to insist, that you read the whole letter. If you're studying up the New Testament letter, read the whole thing through in one go. And I want to add to that, read it out aloud. Now, can you think of reasons for doing that before I tell you? Because they didn't know how to... Uh, no, what was it? They didn't read in their mind when these were written. All right, so there's two things. There's the reading right through and there's a read aloud. So let's pick up the read aloud. You can't it, speed read when you... You can't speed read, read when you read aloud. And I have to tell you this. Reading in our heads is a modern invention. People did not read in their heads till around 1200. Up till that point, every single person who read, read aloud. So if you went into a library, they were noisy places. People would pull out a scroll, sit down on a stool, read aloud. Now, not shouting reading aloud, but reading aloud so you could hear with your ear. There were reasons why it had to be like that. But every, everybody read aloud. Everything had to be read aloud. Exactly, that's right. But you had to. That was the only way you could read. There were one or two people who could do it in their heads. The biographer of Julius Caesar said, Oh, Julius Caesar had the most amazing ability. He could read silently. As if that was an absolute miracle. Because all reading was, was done aloud. So picking up the thought of reading aloud, avoiding distractions, not missing stuff. I guarantee when you read aloud, you'll think... I've never noticed that before, or I've never quite seen that before, or, oh wow, look at that. I guarantee, I did this Ephesians a few days ago, and I thought, oh, how many times have I read bits of verse? Never noticed that before. Debbie talked about the reading aloud thing as well. It was mm. like something about going in your ears and... That's right. The principle is that when you hear it in your ears, when you speak it with your mouth, yep. hear it with your ears, it actually goes into your spirit. That's, That's right. just the biblical principle. The hearing of the Word of God affects your spirit when you hear it physically with your ears. Mm -hmm. It's just a biblical principle. Remember right back at the very beginning, God said, let there be light, and there was light. Things came into being, and it's the same in our spirits. Things come into being when we hear God's Word through our ears. 
That's why it's important to read scripture in worship, for example. So as a group of people, we are hearing the word of God. It's going physically in our ears in feeding our spirits. Mm. That's why it's really important. Yeah. I have a friend who takes it one step further. Yeah. He actually stands in front of a mirror uh -huh. and reads it. So he sees it being uh -huh. read. He hears it. Yes. You know, so That's a wonderful yeah. thought. Yeah. Yes. Wonderful thought. Okay. Why do you think it's important? Leave the aloud for the moment. Why do you think it's important to read the whole of the letter right through? Context. Sorry? You get it all together. Good. Yeah. Yeah, context. Context? It's how they were designed. That's exactly it's right. Sorry, That's right. Written. Yes. Yeah. Any other thoughts? If you don't if you read this in pieces as I'm doing at the moment, <laughs> um, you don't understand what it's all about. You read a little bit here, then you go to That's right. Different chapter yeah. there, but you don't yeah. understand actually what you are reading. Yes, you don't get the full picture. Yeah. That's right, you don't get the full picture. But let's just, let's just, yeah. Question on that one. Yeah. Uh, but there is a time and place for reading the whole book and reading bits and pieces, right? My answer would be I think you need to read the whole book a number of times until you've really got it before you start reading bits and pieces. Because by reading bits and pieces without knowing the, how the whole thing fits together, you can so easily get it wrong. Yep. Mm. But So you, you can read little bits as long as you're keeping aware As long as you're keeping context. aware of the larger thing. Yep. And the, the bigger chunks of Bible you read, I think the more effective, the more effective it is, to be honest. Mm. But I certainly think that you need to have the bigger picture under your belt before you start reading little bits and bits and pieces. I mean, if you think about it, the thought that comes to my mind is like me giving you two or three pieces of a jigsaw and say, hey, you'll really enjoy this. And I put three pieces of a jigsaw on, and you look at it and you see a bit of green and a bit of gold and a bit of blue. And you think, oh, that's very pretty. But that's not worth looking at. Well, when I give you the whole jigsaw and you put it all together, you think, wow, what a wonderful picture of a field of daisies. Whoa, this is glorious, isn't it? Look, there's a little house there. Look, there's a tree and there's a bird down here. Whoa, what a wonderful picture. So I think it's really important for us to get the big picture before we start pulling out bits and pieces. And so let's uh, expand that a little bit. First of all, that's how it was written in the first place. Paul didn't say, okay, I'll write a couple of little bits today and maybe a couple of little bits tomorrow and Thursday, yeah, next Thursday I'm free, I'll write, maybe I'll write the end next Thursday and perhaps the introduction to Thursday after and maybe a couple of days after that. No, 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 Paul dictated the whole of the letter from start to finish and then rolled it up and sent it off with somebody. That's how it was written and that was how it was intended to be read. When he sent a letter to a church, he expected them to start at the beginning and read the whole thing right through. And then to start at the beginning and read the whole thing right through. And then to start at the beginning and read the whole thing right through. Until they really got it. Because they didn't have the whole of the Bible. They might only have just a few little scrolls. So they're going to wring out every element of truth that they can out of this letter. That they, that, you know, that's possible, possible to do. Yes, that's right. A lot of listeners. And I guess there were people who helped them to understand any sticky bits, but mostly they expected that as they read it through, they would get what, what Paul is talking about. We've talked about the, the, the getting the flow of thought. Remember what I said. These are carefully crafted. Paul, Paul has an idea that he wants to get, or ideas that he wants to get across. So there's a flow of thought. And as you read it through, you begin to follow the flow of thought. And you realize this is not just a random collection of little spiritual thoughts. <coughs> this is not just, oh, here's a nice little spiritual thought. Let's write it down. Here's another nice little. It's, 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 there's a flow to the whole thing. Uh, it, it, we also, what we notice when we read the whole letter through, is that we spot the overarching themes. What's going on in Paul's head? when he's writing a particular letter. For example, Galatians. He's really angry in Galatians. What's driving him so angry? Well, there's a particular theme, and you see it at the beginning, and it drives its way right through the six chapters. 
So when you get to chapter 5 on the Holy Spirit, the theme is still there. And if you read the whole letter through, you see this theme just constantly popping up in different sorts of ways to try and persuade these Galatians to get out of the trap that they're beginning to fall into. So the overarching theme. And you also spot, you know, phrases or words that Paul uses. You also spot the difference between the theology and the practical sections of the letter. And what it does is it counters what I call soundbite reading. I think we're very bad at that, to be honest. We pull out odd verses and we present them as a soundbite. Now, you know how frustrated people get, especially politicians, when all the media does is bring a soundbite. And what, they will, what will they say? They will say, no, 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 you've taken it out of context. And I'm afraid we do that astonishingly often when we handle the scriptures. So we, we need to, 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 to counter that. It does guard against taking verses out of context. And like I said about the fruit of the Spirit, you'll find quite often that when you read the thing in context, you'll think, hmm, that doesn't mean what I thought it meant. For example, the verse, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Read that in context and you'll discover that actually is saying something quite different. And the new NIV has actually picked up that because they've recognized that for years and years and years people have misused that verse. So the NIV 2011 version actually corrects that, which is interesting. Well, thank you, Jim. That's quite a lot because I think, yeah, I'm sure I'm staying what that verse is about. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. And then it falls into mm. place a bit. Mm -hmm. Falls into place. Remember, that's right. Can you remember what somebody has said in the message or something? That's right. And then, of course, when you read it through out loud, you don't miss stuff. It's easy when you scan reading or reading quickly or just pulling out a verse or two, you miss some stuff. But when you're reading the whole thing through, you suddenly realize, whoa, there's a lot more in this than I thought. A few years ago, I had to uh, teach a seven-week course on Galatians. I was astonished at how, excuse me, how much I hadn't read in Galatians. I think there were three bits that I knew. The fruit of the Spirit is, and uh, it's no longer I that liveth, but Christ who lives in me. And I think there was a third one. And when I asked the class, tell me what the bits are that you remember from Galatians, they said, the fruit of the Spirit is no longer Christ who lives, and the third one, which was the one I could remember too. And the rest of the six chapters were totally unknown to us. And they were astonished as we worked through chapter by chapter to discover what was in there. And it was like, you know, over the years we just pulled out these little bits. But when you read the whole thing through, you discover that there are gems and insights and understandings in the whole letter that are just amazing. I suppose that's the way we've actually been taught to read the Bible, like in the sense, you know, actually, from, me, the, from the preaching. All right. We only get sound bites, and so in my mind, that's why I've always I had previously taken... I was going to say, I, I, I think I'd take issue with your first sentence. I don't think we have been taught to read the Bible. Mm. I think some things have been modelled to us... Mm. But I don't think that we have actually been taught the kind of things I'm teaching you tonight, mm -hmm. which we should be. I mean, that's why we do that with our students when they first come in. We have to establish this right from the word go. And then when we get to the preaching bit, they've got all this under their belt, and they model something quite different. And when you hear our preachers, they really do model something quite different. And they're always coming to me saying, I don't want to take anything out of context. Can you help me with this? Can you... You know, I, I, I want to make sure that we are, we're saying the right thing. So can we, can we fit this into the larger framework and so on and so forth? So I think it's, it's poor models. And that's not a judgment or criticism. It's just the way it is, I think. Yep. It's the modeling that I think. I think if we'd been taught how to read the Bible, it, we'd have come out right. Remember what I said 2,000 years ago? You didn't have to tell them how to read a letter. Yep. They knew how to read a letter. We have not read letters as they should be. Mm -hmm. And other books too, I think, is, is, is also true. Back in the 80s, we went through a period of time in the church down there that you chose smaller books mm. in the New Testament, or the Bible anyway, mm. and you read it every day. Well, okay. Oh, right. But what you're saying now, that really was kind of a waste of time, because I could read it, but some of the smaller ones I could almost memorise yes. them. 
but you weren't really reading it. You okay. weren't really taking in and yeah. understanding. You were reading it. Yes, but not actually getting but it. Not digesting it. Yes, yes, yes. 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 The same thing. It's somewhat like just like a, a scripture. Yes. You get a verse. Is that right? And well, you, you yeah. get, or a passage, and you'd have to remember it and go over it and over and yes. over for a month. But really, as you see, you've got to read the context to get the full the full picture of it. Exactly. Yeah. That's right. Context, context, context is king. Yeah. I mean, they, they know me as David Context Wells at college. That's my <laughs> nickname. Every I've, I've, I've had sixteen generations of well, eighteen actually generations. And if you say to them, David Wells, one word, context. In fact, a few years ago, somebody bought me a huge big tie. I mean, a really big tie, and it just says context, 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 <laughs> all the way down the tie, because they. <laughs> knew that that was, the, that that was the crucial thing. Context is king when you read the Bible. Absolutely. If there's one thing I want you to remember for tonight, is that context is king. Is that why the uh, Old Testament is so jolly hard to read? Yes. Yes, because we often pluck out little bits and pieces, and we, and we, we, we lose a sense of the, of the context of it. And especially for things like the prophets, are quite hard if you don't know what the, 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 the story is behind a prophet. Yeah. Can be hard. Yeah. All right, let me let me pause there. We've spent rather a lot of time on that, but I think it's probably worthwhile doing. Let's just pause and say, what has been the most helpful sort of stuff that we've said so far tonight? We'll, we'll just aim for a few more minutes and then we'll stop. But what has been the most helpful thing? The, the way that you said to, um, how to, to read the, right. the book read the whole letter yes. and to yep. read it out loud. Yep. Um, I think that will actually in my case help a lot yep. to understand more of what I am reading. Yep. Good. Okay. Thank you. Samantha. The writing to people as a group, mm -hmm. that one not necessarily been helpful but more caused more questions. Mm -hmm. But like mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Those are four mm -hmm. Just basically understanding that it's a, it's a letter, it's a context letter that mm -hmm. starts from, from start, you've mm -hmm. got to read it through to the end mm -hmm. to get the full picture, mm -hmm. shape, size, whatever they're saying, but mm -hmm. there's an understanding, not just reading the passage mm -hmm. and taking it from that, mm -hmm. take the whole picture and, mm -hmm. and, and truly understand mm -hmm. what, what they're talking about mm -hmm. and who's talking about it and who it is that's talking yeah. and, what are they, yeah. and who they're talking to. Because mm -hmm. if you wrote a letter to somebody you would get really upset if they picked out a paragraph and said, this is what Steve is all about, wouldn't you? You'd really get put out about that. You'd say, you obviously haven't read the whole of the letter. If you did, then you would make sense of this in the context of the whole letter. Yeah. So all we're asking for, really, is kind of what we would expect in the day to day. So good thoughts, Steve. Yeah. Somebody else? Mario, anything that's been helpful to you tonight? Yeah, it's um, like you were saying about um, knowing the why and who is writing mm. and about the you. Mm. Um, how many times we take it verbatim mm. and then when it says you, mm. it's talking to me. So mm. you personalize it. <coughs> but um, if you look at the whole context, mm. as you were saying, then you see the big picture. That's right. we're actually looking at the picture by this, by yeah. doing this. But yeah. then you read the whole thing and, and it's yeah. like, oh, now I can see actually what it means. Yeah. That's what it's good. Out, and good talk. Then you will understand. And then, then the revelation will come. That's right. What God wants to tell you. That's right. Yes, <coughs> that's right. Because he's talking to you as part of us. That's right, yes. As part of the family. Yeah. You're not a solitary oh, individual. The body of it's you as the body. As a body. Yeah. It's you as a family. You but as we the take people it, of God. Most of yes, the time we have right. to take it verbatim as it's only me. That's right. That's right. You're on your own page. No. Okay, anybody else want to share something that's been helpful with you so far? I think number four. Number four? Okay, yes. Because I think that's the most important one, to be honest. I do. Yeah. Good. All right, good. Well, I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll do five minutes, and we'll just talk very briefly about...
the letter to the Ephesians itself. So you do feel as if we're going to start the letter. Because <laughs> we've spent a lot of time on that first, but I think it was worth doing. <coughs> it took a bit longer than I expected. <laughs> well, I think it's good to go say good solid foundation. Yeah. All right, Colin, thank you very much. Yeah, that's good. Okay. Have you got a fill-in sheet? Uh, the one in your left hand. That one there. Turn it round. That's the one. Good. That's the one. Now, first of all, just have a look at the maps for a minute or two. The left-hand map, you can find the city of Ephesus. I'm going to put your finger on it. It's at the western end of Turkey. So next to it is Greece, and then next to it again is, is Italy. So there's Rome, there's Athens, there's Corinth, and there's Ephesus. Now, if you look at the right-hand map, we've added a few of the neighboring cities. Ephesus, uh, Laodicea, Philadelphia, Sardis, Thyatira, Pergamon, and Smyrna are all little cities around. And near Laodicea is actually the city of Colossae. And that's quite significant when we think about the, the letter to the Colossi, to, the, to the Ephesians. So we'll just, I'll just fill you in for a couple of minutes and then we'll, we'll, we'll rest there. Um, Paul, when he's writing to the letter to the Ephesians, that means the Christians in the city of Ephesus and the surrounding district, is in prison. Now we're not exactly sure... There's some question. Is he in prison in Rome, the left-hand map, or is he actually in prison in Ephesus? bit hard to tell. We're not exactly sure. I think possibly he's in prison in Ephesus. Uh, but it could be that he's in Rome. Either way, it doesn't really matter. He's in prison, whichever prison you're in. Um, the second thing to say is that Somewhere around the same time, he has written the letter to the Colossians. Colossae, as I say, is just next door to Laodicea. And Colossae had a very serious problem. Problem of false teaching. So Colossae is a letter that really does speak to the issue of a certain kind of false teaching. So as you read through Colossae, you have to keep saying to yourself, Paul is saying this because somebody is saying the opposite. So in the first chapter of Colossians, Paul talks a lot about how great Jesus is because people are saying how small Jesus is. Uh, in chapter 2, he talks about not following rules and regulations about certain days and certain practices and certain activities because there were people in the church who were saying you need to do this and need to do this and need to do this to be a proper Christian. So whenever you read Colossians, it's almost like you have to read the reverse for the problem. He's saying this because people are saying the opposite. It's like listening to one side of a telephone We've said that already. Yeah. Yes, that's right. Yeah. It is. That's right. Now, here's the thing. It seems as if, after he writes this specific letter to the Colossians, Paul begins to think some of this stuff would be really helpful for the larger, the larger church. So he writes the letter to the Ephesians shortly after he writes the letter to the Colossians. But of course the larger church doesn't have that kind of problem. So he takes about one third of Colossians and he puts it in Ephesians. So if you ever have the time to read Colossians and then Ephesians, you'll see that quite a chunk of Colossians has found its way into Ephesians. There's a real match between the two. And what it looks like is Paul is not just writing to the church in Ephesus, but he's writing to all these churches in this second map, the right-hand map. It's like it's a circular letter. So he gives it to the church in Ephesus, or sends it to the church in Ephesus, and says, okay, guys, pass it around to all these other churches. Interesting, the same churches appear at the beginning of the book of Revelation. Same thing happens. John sends a letter to each one of the the, the church is in that same district. It feels like there's a repeat that's going on in there. So it's probably a general letter. Last thing. There seem to be four things uh, that Paul is concerned about. They're not big problems like Colossae has, but there are issues. And the first issue is the possibility of conflict between 
Christians with a Jewish background and Christians with a non-Jewish background. We call those Gentiles. And we'll talk about that next time. But there's a certain amount of pressure to try and split those two groups or cause problems between those two groups. That seems to be one issue. Second issue seems to be that the Christians in Ephesus particularly were rather frightened of evil spiritual powers. It was a city that was full of demonic activity. And it seems like the Christians there were a bit sort of anxious and maybe frightened. And Paul is wanting to reassure them about some stuff. The third thing is that Paul wants to give the Christians in the whole area a big picture of the church. He has a real thing in Ephesians about how big and, and significant the church is. No, just calling, just the, the church as a whole. So the church everywhere is, is what he's talking about. They were building them some churches, but they didn't really know how to bring them. No, no. They were just groups of Christians who met together, workshops, people's homes, under the trees. Yeah, what was happening in that church and what was happening in that church was the same. Quite often, yes, yes. In this case, Paul wants to give everybody a really big theological picture of the church. And the fourth thing is that Paul wants to talk about living out the life of Christ in everyday situations. He wants to say, this is, this is what's happened to you, this is who you are, this is the life of Christ that you have, this is where you are in Christ. Now, let's live it out in everyday situations. This is what it would look like for this to be a daily reality for you. So those four particular things are what drive the letter to the Ephesians. In other words, when you're reading through Look for anything about Jews and Gentiles. Look for anything about spiritual powers and forces. Look for what he has to say about the church. And look for what he has to say about living out the life of Christ in everyday situations. Those are the four things to look for. The question I ask now is, where did he get all this information? Who gave him this information to write these letters? Revelation directly from God. Yes, revelation from God. Thought, but then why are you talking? You must have come from another authority. No, no. He, he, he did talk to the other apostles. Oh, yes, he, of course. He talked to the other apostles, but he got his gospel directly by revelation. And he knows what's going on in the churches, obviously, because if he's in prison in Ephesus, people are pottering in to see him and reporting what's kind of happening. So he knows what the general mood of things is in the churches round about that he's responsible for. Yeah. All right, here's your homework. I've given you the whole of Ephesians on two sheets of paper. Those are the ones, that's it, Stephen, those two. Now, what I want you to do between now and next uh, Thursday is to read out aloud in one go the whole of those four sides of, of Ephesians. Don't worry about the things I've highlighted. I'll explain those next time. We have, I thought we might get onto that tonight, but we haven't. So I want you to read through just the whole, and read it aloud, and it will take you nine minutes. <laughs> yes, it will. It will take you nine minutes to do that. Sorry, what, what am I saying? 20, no. It took me nine minutes to do the first half. 18 minutes. It will take you 18 minutes. Beg your pardon. Nine minutes for the first half, nine minutes. Actually, eight minutes for the second. It's slightly shorter. It's a reason why I don't read. <laughs> so 20 minutes. So set yourself a time and a place where you will not be distracted. Turn your phone off. Close the door. Sit in the loo if necessary. Or find some quiet place. And just read out aloud the whole of the letter. And then report back what your experience was next time. Not because I'm going to mark you on it. But just I want you to tell me what it feels like when you read through the, the letter out aloud. David, how do I get on living in a retirement Have you got a car? Hey. Have you got a car? Yeah. Okay, here's what you do. Nice sunny day, drive your car down to the side of the Hutt River and either go outside if there's nobody around or sit in your car with a window slightly down so you can breathe and do it there. Always find some place. 
or if necessary, come to the church here on one day when it's not being used and just go into the room at the front, you know, the auditorium there and do it there, Michael won't mind. Mind. Walk around if it's helpful to you. You don't have to sit. But just just find some place where you've got 20 minutes, that's all it will take, I guarantee. 20 minutes, just read it out aloud, and then we'll see how we, we go next time. We haven't gone as far as we were hoping to go here. Uh -huh. yeah. You want to say something? Yes. Yes? What we want to do each time is um, give you some fresh thoughts about praying the scriptures. So how do we pray from Ephesians? And what I wanted you to do is to take a few minutes now to read verses 1 to 14 of chapter 1. And let me tell you what I'm... Can yeah, you can do it with that. What, what I want you to discover is how you can hear God's voice through Scripture. I'll read this to take home and look at. Because the Word of God is living and active. <coughs> and the Spirit can speak to us through the Scriptures. And often, as we read a passage, a verse or a phrase or even just one word can just kind of be highlighted to us. And we need to know what to do with that. And that's what I want to tell you about. Recognize that this is the Holy Spirit. He is at work when you feel drawn to a phrase or a verse, uh, or, or, you know, something in that passage. This is the Holy Spirit. He wants to get your attention, so you have to linger there. You have to stay there for a while. And the key is to say the words over. Just say them over a number of times. It's like savouring food. See, we can read the scriptures to understand, but we can also read the scriptures to change our hearts. So it can work for our minds, our understanding, and our hearts. So we have to savour it. And then we could say to the Lord, what do you want to say to me through this that you've highlighted to me? And sometimes what happens is that that word or phrase will connect with something that's already going on for us. Uh, we, may, we may have read a story in the Gospels and it kind of reminds us of that and connects with us. Um, there may be a need that we have that that word is beginning to speak to. Uh, there could, I sometimes find when I say the words over again, I start thinking of other verses that have the same kind of thought in, where it, it starts to bounce off. Or maybe it's a word for someone you've been praying for, and the Holy Spirit has given you a form of prayer for them. And as we linger there, as we savour it, it begins to enlarge in us and awaken our minds and hearts to something more than what we get when we just see it with our eyes. We can actually have a conversation with the Lord on the basis of that word that's come alive for us. He's opening our hearts because he wants to do something. And we can turn it into thanksgiving. We can turn it into a declaration of truth that somehow our hearts need to hear. Uh, we could journal, write what our thoughts are about it and ask the Lord to speak to us through that. We can use it to pray for another person. It may be a seed thought that begins to grow in us as we keep pondering on it over a period of days that becomes a message, something we write to somebody else, something we maybe speak out in our group or on Sunday. And what happens, what, the way that it takes root in us is to say it over. This is meditation. Say it over. Deliberately say it over. And I sometimes find that one word will highlight even more as I say it. And then the next time I say it, another word will become more relevant to me. And, and the key is to hang on to that for a number of days. So you're getting more and more out of it. You're, you're, you're feeding on it. It becomes richer the more you do that with just this word. And I, sometimes I write it out, put it in a place where I can see it. 
you know, on a mirror in the bathroom or in the kitchen. Because I see it every time I'm there doing stuff in the kitchen. Uh, find a way to have it with you and remind you of it. And if you say it often enough, it will start to resonate in you. I find if you say it when you go to sleep, as you're going to sleep, and you keep saying it, it will be there in the morning when you wake up. Doesn't it, Colin? <laughs> yeah, it just, it just kind of stays within you. So I'd, I'd like you to, right now, have you got time? Mm. Just five minutes. Right now to read those verses 1 to 14 and just see if the Holy Spirit highlights a phrase or a word for you and then write it out below. And then this week, see how you can work with that, how it can speak to you, what God is trying to say to you through it. And then if you get anything really exciting happening because of that, you could tell us next week. So here's what I've just told. So just take a minute now to read those verses.